Okay. So, uh, uh, so, so when, when today is going to be the last class for about a month. Our next class will be I think on the 30th of April, when we can we'll continue. Um, okay. In today's class, I uh, we're, we're going to end our discussion to, uh, of formal properties of string amplitudes today. So when we come back, we will begin by discussing uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the the requirement of conformal invariance of the alpha prime expansion to try to derive beta function. Sorry. Hello? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, separate. Why, why to spend them separate? My set, my set. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, uh, so we'll go as uh, anything we can say today. We, we do, and maybe we should spend the time on this. I'll perhaps I'll go a little faster than usual. Last, just try to cover. Okay. So first, uh, uh, first cl uh, clearing up loose ends from last last time. Last class we were discussing three amplitudes of the sphere, and uh, uh, we uh, completely understood all the singularities, all imaginary parts of these amplitudes, in terms of, uh, uh, we found that these singularities were exactly all associated with propagation of intermediate particles in fine particles. Okay? Uh, and uh, therefore we concluded that string amplitudes obeyed the unitarity properties of, uh, uh, obeyed the unitarity conditions of game, that uh, um, the space-time restrictions of unitarity in the same way, the final diagram, the final diagram expansion of this. Okay. There were two loose ends. The first loose end was this business about the B0, B0 delta. But that's exactly as uh, uh, we discussed, as Lognagon suggested last. That goes exactly as Lognagon suggested last class. Uh, essentially, the two-point function between B and C is non-zero. Uh, between C and C is zero, and C and B is zero. Okay? So, if you want... Uh, um, uh, if you want the same states, namely states that are animated by B on both sides, then you need to have expl uh, explicit factors of B0, B0, B0 and B0 tilde, which is what we had last class. Okay? So the factors that we had last class is what was needed in order to make both states physical, because the inverse metric that connected the two states would otherwise have connected a state that is annihilated by B, which is with a state that is annihilated by C. Okay? So to convert that state that's annihilated by C into a state that, are, that is annihilated by B in the physical state of string theory, you need those extra factors of B0 and B0. So those factors were there and they were slightly complicated. Okay? Uh, the second one that we didn't have time to talk about last class, so let's quickly 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 turn to that, was that we seem to be getting unitarity, except that what was running in the channels, what was running in the channels was all the states of string theory. In all states that came out of the conformity theory, because remember what we used was completeness sum of conformity theory, and not merely the states that obeyed um, uh, that that laid Q cohomology. You remember we, we, we inserted a complete set of states, those are complete set of states of the conformity theory, and that was all states. However, uh, you know, as you know, we have a physical state associated only with a, a state of the conformity theory that lies in Q cohomology. So in order for this really to be a uh, consistent with space time unitarity. We must have that the contribution of all states that are not in Q cohomology vanishes. Okay? And how does that work? Well, uh, this works in a very simple fashion. Okay, just, just, uh, so let's, 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 uh, um, let's see this in detail. Okay. You see, first I'm going to remind you of the representation theory of an operator that squares this. So an operator that squares to zero has two kinds of irreducible representations. Okay? The first kind of irreducible representation is, uh, is two-dimensional, and the second kind is one-dimensional. The two-dimensional representation is, uh, is made up by a set of states A and B, such that B is equal to Q and A, okay? and uh, therefore Q and B is equal to zero. Okay? So if you wrote this out in a matrix, you get 0, 1, and 0, 0. Okay? The second kind of irreducible representation is when Q acts on some side to give you 0. That can happen in a state that's annihilated by, uh, 
by uh, by I may and with the condition you know and that there is no state there, there is no psi prime does not exist a psi prime such that q of psi prime is equal to psi not true okay so these are the states that we call physical states they are annihilated by q and are not q exactly these are the states these states that are like p are the states that uh, that sorry states that are like a are states that we call unphysical because they are not annihilated by q and states that are like p are annihilated by q therefore they are physical but they are q exact okay so they are pure gate states okay now the key point is that there is a one to one map between unphysical states and pure gauge states. Because if a state is pure gauge, it is Q of something. Therefore, that, that something that is Q of is not annihilated by Q. Okay? So, irreducible representations of this Q operator, you know, we move to a basis such that this Q looks like 0, 1, 0, 0, many blocks of these, and then blocks in which it just zeros exist. Okay? So, the physical states, the unphysical states, and the Q exact states are paired with each other. Well, there's physical states that look. Is this clear? Now, so, uh, what I'm going to do is to take all of my conformal field theory and take any basis of the unphysical states. Okay. Let's, let's call some i unphysical. Hey, this is in general infinite dimensional basis. You can create it with energy, in which case it will become finite dimensional, and everything we say will become a quite a Okay, great. Then, this defines a natural basis on the space of Q exact states. Okay, so Q on I unphysical gives us a basis for the state of the space of Q exact states. Okay? And then, in, I, I will also add J physical in an arbitrary set, an arbitrary basis, in the remainder of the space. The, the, the a basis that is needed to complete this into a basis of all of the space. Okay? Uh, uh, and uh, uh, this gives us a, a basis in this uh, space of physical states. This thing, by the way, is of course not terribly well defined. You know, it's it's very choice dependent. Because to a physical state, you can always add a Q exact state and then remain there. Okay? But I'm not saying that it's a unique basis, I'm saying choose any. It's not a unique space. Yes, but a complete, uh, for it to be complete state, I mean, sorry, complete inverse space, like you do not need to take into account uh, physical plus. The exact state. Uh, well, we exactly we call basis on basis. You choose any basis of physical. We chose a basis on physical states. We chose a basis. We could you know do it more. Anyway, but we've chosen a basis of physical state. We've chosen a basis of few exact states. And after that, we choose an arbitrary basis of physical states. What is a physical state? Well, you complete the basis of physical states. Anything, any completion. We give you a state that cannot be written as a linear combination of unphysical states, therefore not unphysical, and cannot be written as a linear combination of Q and sum, therefore not exact. Okay? Now, there's a great deal of arbitrariness in this in, in all these choices I've talked about, especially the last one. Because to any suppose you give me a, a basic physical, you know, of uh, physical states, I can add to that some linear combination of the Q on something in states, and it'll remain physical. Right? Because physics, you know, it's really the thing that is really defined is cohomology classes. Okay? So that changes not just our basis but also our space. But we won't care. It won't matter for this. Okay? So I just define some basis. All you want to define some basis like this. That's all that I do. Okay. Then in the basis that I have, once I've chosen this basis, I define a projection operator P that projects onto physical. 
Okay? So this is projected onto the space spanned by the space. Okay? So P on JP equals JP and P on all of these is equal to P on I on physical is equal to P on Q times I on physical. Okay? And the next thing I do is to define an operator U which does the following. It inverts the action of Q but only on Q exact states. That is, Q, U on, I define this operator such that U on Q times I on physical is equal to I on physical. U on I on physical is equal to zero. U on J physical is equal to zero. Operators in my basis, it's totally well fact. It's like these are linear operators, so I find the action on the basis and define them in. Okay. Now, in terms of these operators, let me make the important claim. The identity operator can be written as, uh, uh, as uh, P plus. That's the Q U plus U. Let's check. Suppose we act on a physical state. Okay? We, uh, we, we get back to physical state because P on physical state gives us back in itself. Q and I raise physical states, and by definition, U and I raise physical states. Okay? Suppose we act on an unphysical state. P annihilates it. Now, U annihilates it. Q doesn't annihilate it, and U inverts the, oper uh, the operation of Q. So I get back the unphysical state. On the other hand, suppose I act on an exact state. It's annihilated by U, it's annihilated by P, but U removes the Q and then I act Q again. So once again, I've got the, the same exact state. Okay, so with my definition of P and U, okay, you see what, what we do, what these what these definitions are, right? In these two class two clouds, U undoes the operation of Q. But it can't undo the operation of Q on physical states. So it doesn't do anything. It's the nearest to an inverse that exists for the Q, right? It's the nearest to an inverse operator. Okay? Uh, with this, we, we demonstrated that identity is this. Okay. So, now, let us remember what we did. We, in, in, we used the fact that a complete, that, um, uh, uh, so, U is a fermionic operator? U is a fermionic operator, last week. And because Q is, Q is Okay. So, uh, remember what we did in order to get this, this unitarity. We, in, 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 we, uh, we inserted identity, which we then expanded as a complete set of states. Okay? So let's insert identity. Okay? But, since in this identity insertion, Q acting either on the left or on the right and having its every. Remember what, what we had? We had... Um, uh, a, B, and suppose you had some, some Q here. This gives you zero as we bound you in many ways. Let me bound you either from operator arrangement or from contour integral arrangement, right? Because Q is the integral of, of the BRSP current, and that can just be pulled around the sphere to give you zero. Right? Because it, it, each operator in the circle is also gives you zero because. Yeah, okay, so as Q as Q acting either on the left or on the right is zero, we can just find out these things. So inserting identity 
for the correlation functions we're computing is the same thing as inserting the projector onto physical states. So we can restrict our sum of states that appears in this in the decomposition of identity to the sum uh, to, to the sum of states over of physical states. Okay? So although we in our formal arguments we did a complete uh, we did a complete set sum, we, re we resolved identity into uh, uh, a, into all states, the contribution from unphysical and QXAT states vanishes. Okay? So that's that's the key point. Uh, and it's a little obvious if you think about it. The, the point, just to say it a little more colloquially, is that it's very much like this BC business that we talked about. That in the completeness sum, okay, uh, an unphysical state is accompanied by a QXAT state. Or QXAT state is accompanied by an unphysical state. And one of the two, an identical state on the left. It's very much like how it happens in QED. Yes, in fact, that's a precise. If this, this is, if you restrict to the master set, this would be what happens uh, in QED. You see, it's just, you know, you reduce to the, the low end, and you get the same argument in QED. Okay, so, 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 um, fine. Okay, so that kind of completes our discussion of unitarity of tree level string theory. Uh, as you see, we've done it in a very, very explicit. Well, it's formal with all this complete stuff. But in a way, uh, the key point is that we relate two beautiful structures. Namely, the structure of the OPE on the world sheet uh, and the structure of the Hilbert space interpretation of the world sheet. You see, uh, actually, it's the second thing that's going on. See, until two or three lectures ago, we pretended that field theory was justified by path. Moralities, right? That's all we need in order to compute string But in order to isolate the singularity structure of uh, string theory diagrams, it was very useful to remember that there's another important element in quantum mechanics. There's one way of thinking of it by, through the path technique, but the second way of thinking through Hilbert spaces. And that was the useful way of thinking in order to understand the singularities of quantum diagrams, the imaginary parts of quantum diagrams, and in particular the completeness sum. Uh, it's a very useful device. Okay? So it's this interplay, the fact that you can take this path integral and cut it, always have this Hilbert space interpretation. Uh, and in this Hilbert space interpretation, you can then isolate the, uh, sing uh, the singularities of finite diagrams that allow us to understand the, pre the precise nature of these singularities and to demonstrate that they're going to be trained for trade on Is that clear? Questions or comments about it? Okay, now I'm going to tell you how the same analysis, uh, or very similar analysis, gener generalizes to three uh, to loop level diagrams. Okay, now our discussion is going to be uh, more schematic than the three level thing, um, basically because it, in order to give you a really satisfactory discussion, but in order to demonstrate each claim that I'm going to make, we will have to veer off into a lot of mathematics about the structure of Riemann surfaces, that we will not go to that. Okay, so I'm going to, I'm going to be asserting some statements about uh, uh, about Riemann surfaces, as, as you will see. Uh, Kulczynski gives references to places where these statements are proved, if you're, if you're interested. Okay, so, uh, so before we start, what, what is our goal? Our goal is to understand two things. A, well, our goal is to understand the statement that you've heard of and that string perturbation theory gives you finite results. At least has no UV no UV divergences. We saw an example of this for that, the active magnitude for the dollars. We want to see this in module. We want to see this in module gravity. The second thing we want to understand is that string theory is uh, uh, gives us the rules of, uh, of string perturbation theory give us results that are guaranteed to be the, the term be consistent with the unit. These two things we want to understand. Well, let's do this in a formal way, uh, but just to see, you know, where it comes from. Okay. So, in order to try to address these questions, the first thing we have, you see, where do divergences in field theory come from? Divergences in field theory come from integrating over uh, final diagrams. 
doing this integral over Schwinger parameters, the moduli space of binary parameters, if you like. Okay? So, uh, of course, if you have divergences in, uh, in string theory, it's going to be, it's origin will be the same, same place, doing the integral over moduli, the moduli space of Riemann spaces. Okay? So, the first thing we have to do in order to address questions of a finiteness and as we'll see also for unit acting, is to understand the moduli space of Riemann services a little bit. Okay? So that's 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 our goal. And uh, uh, for this purpose, I'm going to introduce a construction, a construction that allows you to construct higher genus Riemann services, starting with lower genus Riemann services. Um, and this 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 construction has some findings, some plumbing fixed. Plumbing fixture. Okay, you'll see why. Okay, so yeah. So, so the first thing I'm going to do is introduce to you the, 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 the plumbing fixture. Okay, so suppose you have two different Riemann surfaces. Uh, if you want, you can imagine them to be spheres, then it could be anything. Okay? And I've got a coordinate patch. Remember what a Riemann surface is. Riemann surface is a, is a manifold, you know, uh, defined in a theory where wire transformations are Okay, so different patches on uh, you, you can do write it patchwise as uh, 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 as complex space with an arbitrary uh, conformal, which is uh, with a metric that is dz dz bar, just conformally related to dz dz bar, and uh, uh, there has to be a coordinate ch uh, change where it overlaps under which the metric matches up to a y factor. The y factor is a regular sign. Okay. So, consider one of these coordinate patches in which the metric is some y factor times dz dz bar. Okay? And consider another y uh, another patch here, um, uh, which has the same proper, which, you know, so, so this coordinate patch we find here, and let's call this z1 coordinate patch, and let's call this the z2 coordinate patch. Okay? And let's say that this coordinate patch is defined up to boot uh, mod z1 is less than uh, 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 is less than uh, mod q to one half for some q. And similarly, the other coordinate patch is defined up to mod z2 is less than mod q to one half for, for the same. Okay, now what I want to do, okay, now what I want to do is uh, to define a new Riemann surface in the following. I'm going to remove, I'm going to remove uh, a disk from here, remove a disk from here. And then join these two things. Okay? So the, the idea is to remove a disk, remove a disk, and join these two things with the chain. Okay? But we have to do this in a way that preserves, that you know, specifies complex structure. Okay? So that is why what we're going to do is remove not the whole disk all the way up to Q, but only up to, so we will remove a disk. Which is mod z1 is less than square root q, square root of mod q, times 1 minus epsilon for some positive epsilon. Okay, so we're not removing all of the disk, only some part of it. Similarly, here we will remove mod z2 is less than square root q, square root mod q, 1 minus epsilon. We're not removing all of the disk, only some part of it. And then what we will do is to identify points in this angulus and this angulus. Okay? We will, we will, we will identify points. We will identify points. Uh, no, just identify points. 
So we, we remove these disks, and in the remaining regions, we identify points according to formula. So that, that identification now joins these two things. This is the two. This remaining part is the two. The two that joins these things. Okay. So we identify points according to the formula. Let's see. According to the formula. Uh, And so we, I'm, I'm going to rem require this thing be defined. Sorry, I'm going to require this coordinate patch be defined not only up to square root q, but square root q over one mega steps. Just, just because we had it, it Of course, that matter. I can choose q to be so small that it will be true. as long as there's an equal. Let's run. Uh, sorry, so this is my requirement. Okay, I choose some epsilon which is zero point one. Okay, and I choose some q such that these quarter patches are defined in this in this slightly slightly larger region. Okay, and then the identification we do is the identification z one z two is equal to. What in that angular? What in that angular region? So what does it do? You see. Uh, uh, so what, what the angular region that was that remains that we used another color was between square root q into one minus epsilon and square root q into one plus epsilon. Okay? And maybe I want to maybe I want to Sorry. Uh, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> uh, uh, let me put it. It's okay, we have the same thing here it won't matter. Okay, okay, sorry. <laughs> Sorry, let's take that. Away. It wasn't. Okay, so uh, uh, so 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 this is the uh, this is the angular region that remains after not removed. Okay, now according to this identification, this inner end here will match over to the outer end here. So the rest of the thing will be like replaced by the. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, as if we have. They replace the inner disk by the rest of the. Uh, as if we replace the inner disk by the, by the remaining three months. Okay? So this inner thing here maps over to the outer edge here. The outer edge here maps over to the inner edge here. And these two things are conformally related because z goes to 1 by z is a conformal transformation. Okay? So what have we done? Suppose this three months of this was defined by a whole lot of coordinate patches, including the one we constantly. Okay? This three month service was also defined by eight three month quantum uh, factors, including the one with three months. Done? Now we've got a new three month service with as many coordinate patches as there were in the sum of these two services. Because we have this coordinate patch, now we've got an overlapping coordinate patch in this service that meets over to the rest of the service. And all the remaining coordinate patches that 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 already existed in both uh, both different services. Okay? And we've given the rule for how uh, points, the, the, the diffeomorphism, you know, how, how you should relate uh, uh, points in this coordinate patch and this coordinate patch where they overlap. That's the rule. Okay? So this is a clean specification of a complex map. This is clear. Okay? Of course, uh, all that changing epsilon does is change how thick the overlap region is. So as long as epsilon is non-zero, it doesn't change anything. Okay? So the manifold itself is specified just by Q, what, which our choice of coordinates Z1 and Z2, and by the, the parameter Q, epsilon is just some uh, uh, intermediate construction, and that will end up to the specification. Okay? But once you've chosen your coordinate charts Z1 and Z2, Q is an import is a property, I mean affects the complex structure of your manifold. If you change uh, you, you, have, you have a choice of doing two things. You could either change Q or you could redefine your coordinate charts Z1 by some factor of Q. 
Okay? And that will give you a new complex map. Okay, is this so? So, given two manifolds, two complex manifolds, with two distinguished coordinate charts, centered around two points, okay, there is a way of connecting them up to give you a, 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 a complex map. Is this clear? This, 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 this thing is called a plumbing fix. Is this clear? Okay, great. Um, now, uh, so for instance, let's let's look at an example. Let's look, for instance, at an, an, an example. Suppose you had, and uh, by the way, this 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 picture can be done either on two separate manifolds or on two different coordinate patches of the same map. Okay. So suppose we have some. A sphere, and we have a quarter patch here, a quarter patch here. We do the plumbing fixture that will give us the torus. You see, if we have a torus, now, now we have a patch here, patch here, we do the fixture, it will give us genus prisms. And so on. So this plumbing fixture can be used to construct higher genus Riemann surfaces starting from lower genus. Okay. Now, um, now we address the following question. We address the question: uh, Can we build an arbitrary Riemann surface? Okay. Can we build an arbitrary Riemann surface? Okay. Let's let's tr let's tr let's try to do the following thing. You see, suppose we had. Um, uh, suppose we had uh, a sphere with three punctures, with three quarter patches. Yeah, and another sphere with three quarter patches. You see, we built the torus by doing this with this, and this with this, for instance. We built the higher genus surface by doing, doing various other things. Then, if you have more spheres with three quarter patches, you can do, do more. Okay. You can convince yourself, basically. You can convince yourself that given an arbitrary number of spheres with three coordinate patches marked on these three spheres, uh, you can build a, a genus a Riemann surface of arbitrary genus. Okay, and the uh, uh, the way one way to think of this is in the sort of final diagram. You see, associate with each of these spheres a trilinear vertex. Okay. And every time uh, you put together, you sew together uh, surfaces on, give, on particular patches, just join up the propagators. Okay. So suppose you did this, then what you have is this one loop thing with, with two uh, vertices that were still left over. You, know, you could use them for external particles, right? Okay. Uh, suppose you want to build something that's two loop. Okay. What what would you do? So let's see. So suppose. Uh, you have something like this, you have something like this, uh, and then you have something like this. Uh, all you have to do is to make it a two loop five minute graph. Okay, that would be a genus two surface with one one point mark. If you want more point mark, points mark, you split this up and do. Plumbing fixture here, uh, starting with spheres with three mark points, so three, three coordinate patches, and using the plumbing fixture, you can uh, you can build up uh, uh, so uh, Riemann surfaces of arbitrary genus. Okay, now um, uh, a question that you might ask. Well, is, the model, is there a systematic way to cover the entire moduli space of genus G Riemann surfaces? Okay? To cover the moduli space of genus G Riemann surfaces by doing the plumbing fixture and varying the moduli of this fixture. Okay, so let's actually do some plumbing first. 
So, uh, uh, okay, but, but, uh, let, let me we'll give you the question, we'll, we'll do the counting as we, as we go. So the question that you might ask is, can, can you try to build up in a systematic way the whole moduli space of some, some genus G Riemann surface, some genus G Riemann surface, by um, starting with, you know, some given fixed sphere with three coordinate patches removed, and by doing the plumping fixture, varying the modulus of this fixture in all those ways. Okay? This is a natural question to ask. And the answer to this question turns out to be not quite, but good yes to enough to, to, to uh, but not quite in a particular way and, uh, and the positivity of this answer is enough to do what we want. So now let me tell you the answer to this question, uh, the technical answer to this question. Uh, yeah. In what I'm going to say now, I'm giving you no proof. This is, I'm just going to cite results from mathematics. Okay, so, uh, so let's, 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 let's make the following statement. Okay, see, um, claim number one, given any Riemann surface, okay, uh, and given a non-contractible cycle, okay, and given any Riemann surface, it is always possible to find a minimal area metric on that Riemann surface, okay, by, by minimal area metric I mean the bottom, I mean a metric such that the length of every non-contractible cycle, the, the length of every non-contractible cycle in that metric is uh, uh, greater than or equal to 2 pi. Okay? But subject to this restriction is otherwise minimal area. You see, talking about a minimal area surface for a Riemann surface without putting some other instruction, the other restriction is meaningless. Because, for instance, for a torus, just shrink it to zero. For any of these things, you just shrink it to zero, right? Since the Riemann surface is defined only after a while factor, then you can always choose a while factor such that the, metric, the area of the metric is zero. Yeah. So, for instance, for the torus, the non contractible cycle. But there won't be any on the sphere. There won't be any on the sphere. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. So this, this would be a little degenerate from the sphere. So, let, so the statement will, will apply to any, every genus 1i. Uh, okay. Every genus 1i. Okay? On the torus, what is this minimal area metric? That's totally clear. It's just a flat metric where each side is left to pi. That way, no non contractible cycle has length more than 2 pi. Yes. And, but you saturate that. So you get a meta, you get a, 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 a surface whose area is 2 pi, the whole thing squared. It's clearly impossible to have a smaller metric than that, a smaller area than that, because uh, otherwise it would require one of the two sides to become smaller than 2 pi. Yeah. Okay? So on the torus, the, the statement is totally obvious. Uh, the clear thing is that in F, on any genus G Riemann surface, G greater than 1, greater than equal to 1, there, is, there exists such a First claim. Okay. Now, second claim is a, a slight generalization of this claim. And that's the problem. Uh, consider a Riemann surface with some marked points. Okay. Now, if we demand that a cycle that that's uh, a, a cycle that goes around one of these marked points is also considered non-contractible. Okay? Then the claim continues to hold true. It is always possible to find a metric on any Riemann surface with marked points, okay, of minimal area, subject to the constraint that no cycle around any of the non-contractible no no curve around any of the non-contractible cycles including the cycles that circle mark points, 
has a length smaller than 2 pi. Now you might think of this, this last thing was really weird because we've got, let's say, a door first, we've got a mark point and you might think, well, I mean, uh, I can go as near the point as I want, how can I prevent myself from having length smaller than 2 pi? But of course you can, depending on what the metric is. So the metric here, suppose this was at z equals 0, it's our local point. Uh, suppose the metric was bz by z over bz bar by z bar. Then the length around any cycle of this would be fixed. And in fact, I may have to put, put some 2 pi's, but it would be fixed and would give me, you know, 2 pi. Okay? So, uh, so, 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 uh, basically, with this condition, you should think of working in a coordinate patch in which instead of having a mark point, you have this tube that goes up to it. Any disk can always be conformally mapped to a tube that goes up to infinity. And so you're looking at, you should work in those coordinates. And you're looking at a metric on a surface with tubes that go up to infinity such that the cycles of these tubes are also considered non contractible and they cannot have lengths smaller than 2 pi. Subject to that, you want to do the areas. Uh, metric, some, some such thing always exists. Okay. Uh, so I'm going to give you many such claims and then we'll make our point. Uh, I'm sorry about this, uh, but okay, uh, it just wouldn't be worth it to to go to some long diversion about how these things are proved. Okay, as long as the statements are clear, uh, that will be sufficient. Okay, third thing. The third thing about this would be uh, is the following. Let us define the band. Okay, any two, any two uh, uh, minimal minimal length geodesics minimal length geodesics that go around some non contractible cycle okay that are uh, uh, homotopic to each other that, that can be continuously continuously moved to each other are set to lie on the same band okay so for on a door on the minimal length doors for instance this guy and this guy are in the same band Okay, or on one of these things with a mark point because this cylinder will not infinity and the whole cylinder lies at the same band. Okay? Now, um, the, the height of a band is defined as the minimum distance between bounding geodesics on the band. Okay? So suppose you've got a band and you, you can't go further on one side. Okay? So that's the end of one band, uh, or that's one end of the band, and you've got a second end of a band. Now look at the minimum distance between a point anywhere in this geodesic and anywhere in that geodesic. Okay? That is defined as the height of a, of a band. Okay? Finally, finally, uh, uh, the perhaps the little most surprising claim of the law is that every point on the on the Riemann's on this minimal area Riemann surface lies in some band of the other, and bands might be that. That is, given any point on the on the Riemann surface, it's always possible to find a minimal length geodesic that goes through this point. So obvious of the talks, of course. Okay, uh, and it may be may be possible to find it in many. Okay, so now we've got this good picture of uh, of this arbitrary height of this Riemann surface. Okay, uh, we've uh, equipped it with a metric. We've equipped it with a metric, which is this minimal area metric. That is minimal area subject to these constraints. You know, in general, the data string theory is just conformal classes of complex structures. But as an intermediate technical device, we've equipped. Uh, the, uh, the, the, the Riemann surface with an actual metric. Okay. Now, now I want to make the claim. The claim is the following. Suppose we look at all Riemann surfaces 
with arbitrary number of mark points such that the height of every band, every internal band on the Riemann surface is less than equal to 2 pi. Okay? And the height of every external band, one of these bands that are these long cubes that are going up to infinity, is less than equal to 2 pi. Pi. Less than equal to pi. Okay? Uh, let's call the set of all such Riemann surfaces, the set of all such Riemann surfaces, let's call that. Um, uh, Engine. This is number of mark points, this is G the set of surfaces. Okay? So this is the set of all the Riemann surfaces of genus G with n mark points equipped to the minimum area metric such that the height of every band, internal band is smaller than equal to 2 pi and the height of every external band is smaller than equal to Now, now we have find the claim, and the claim is this: that associate every such uh, every such Riemann surface with a vertex and uh, an endpoint vertex in a Feynman diagram. Okay. So suppose you want to build up a full moduli space. Suppose you want to build up a full moduli space at genus G. Okay, with M insertions, the way you're supposed to do it is to make all the Feynman diagrams that you can. Okay, using these guys as uh, uh, as vertices, using these guys as vertices. Okay, which you put together with propagators, and the propagators represent the plumbing, the plumbing fixtures. Okay, so let let let, let me uh, 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 let me let me try to uh, uh, let me try to say this. Let 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 let, let, let let's try to look at this again. Yeah, let's try to look at this uh, in an example. Okay. Uh, uh, see, suppose you wanted to look at the sphere. Suppose you wanted to look at the sphere, okay, with four mark points, okay. And uh, oh, by the way, the thing that you're supposed to start with in the sphere, uh, you're, you're supposed to start with V three G and anything that you can build up. Okay. So suppose you have V three zero and anything you see. Okay. So suppose you wanted to build a sphere with four mark points. Okay. Then you. The basic Feynman graphs in your theory are associated, the basic Feynman vertices in your theory are associated with these spheres with three mark points. Now it's easy to build a sphere with four mark points. You can do this. Okay? However, in addition to this, there is also a basic vertex associated with the sphere with four mark points. Okay? And the basic vertex is you look at the minimal area metric on the sphere with mark points, with four mark points, such that each of these stubs, these external stubs, has, has bands, has length smaller than equal to pi. Okay? So the claim is that while you can explicitly cover a large portion of the moduli space of a sphere with four mark points by sewing together these three mark points, things. Okay? You don't cover all of it. What you, the part that you don't cover is precisely that part that gives you these minimal area skin, you know, that is covered by minimal area metrics such that the length of each stub, the height of each band is less than equal to pi. 
Okay? And uh, th these basic guys, of course, uh, these basic guys uh, satisfy the requirement that, that their heights are also less than. So every vertex in your in, 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 in your in your in your theory satisfies this basic requirement. Okay? And then uh, then the claim is that you can put together the whole Mondelite space of the Riemann surface by making this final diagram uh, joining of these basic uh, Riemann surfaces plus all the new vertices at every n and every g. Okay. Now uh, now, I said this confusingly, and I said I'm not trying to explain why this is true. Okay? In the first diagram, for example, there are uh, four of them with, which are which are less than pi, and one of them uh, less than two pi. Uh, uh, yes. Though this is not a non-contractual cycle. You see, what we eventually got, we eventually got a sphere with four one. And on the sphere of four normal lines, in the end, yeah. there's only these four normal lines. Okay? Your question is very relevant though, when you use this to make uh, a surface with a normal practice. Okay? So suppose you uh, you use the plumbing fixture to take a sphere with three mark points and connect it to the Like this to make a torus. You say that this plumbing fixture will give you only those products in which one of the cycles has length greater than equal to 2 pi. Because you join together two stars, each of which have length greater than uh, uh, each of which, uh, which uh, uh, no, no, yes, yes. Then if you see this, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. When you do the joining together, you're supposed to do the joining together with 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 stars of length pi. But then with an arbitrary q plumb with an arbitrary q parameter in this plumbing fixture. That will automatically make the effective length of this larger than two pi. You see, and, 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 and we're only supposed to, I'm, I'm sorry, I should have said this wrong. Okay, we're only supposed to do it from q less than one. Okay, now you can this way. Let me, let me, let, let me, let me. Let me. Let me just think this through, make sure I'm saying this correct.
you see, you see, you see. Um, um, so I said something uh, inaccurately. Let me let me say it correctly. Okay, this VNG represents all Riemann surfaces in which the internal guides, in which the in the the heights of the internal bands is less than equal to two pi. But the heights of the external bands, the stumps that you leave, is exactly equal to pi. Okay? So, you're supposed to take this thing, which has this semi-infinite guy going off here, yeah, and then add it, such that you've got a stump of length pi. Okay. Now, 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 now what I want to say becomes clear. You see, Suppose you join together two stumps of length pi, you would get an internal band of length 2 pi. Now, when you want to do the integral over the whole moduli space of the torus, you should let, let this, this re the relative lengths of the two bands, which is the modulus of the torus, vary over everything. Okay? But you see, it's the plumbing fixture with q less than 1. And um, uh, so, so the claim is that we can do all this with the plumbing fixture, uh, always with mod q less than 1. Okay? So the, the plumbing fixture with, with this mod q parameter in every plumbing integrated from 0 to 1. Okay? That gives you that gives you the whole cover of the moduli space of free Okay. Now, now what's the problem? You see, suppose you had done this plumbing fixture with q equals 1, I'm claiming the following. You take two of these stuffs and you join them together, what you get is, is an internal band of length 2 pi. However, if you do it with a smaller q, you get an internal band of longer length. Okay? Yeah. You see, why, why, why is that? Now, what, what's basically going on is the following. Suppose you've got some patch here and patch here, and you make q very small. Then you're taking a little bit of this patch and a little bit of this patch and joining them here. And joining them here. Okay? But if you did it with this metric, okay, let's, let's, let's draw them. Suppose you get, you've got some funny Riemann surface, but it's got some patch here. You take a little bit of this and plumbing fixture with a little bit of this, a small thing. Okay? And you smoothly interpolate between the metric that's here and here, you get something like this. But in this metric, it doesn't obey the conditions of our minimal area metric. Because this little tube here, if q is so small, has very small, has geodesics that go around this cycle. Yeah. And geodesics that go around this cycle, which have length smaller than you. So you have to change the you have to change the y factor on this Riemann surface in order to make it a minimal area metric. Okay? And when you do that, since the y factor and isotropy, you draw this up to let the y, you also draw this side. Okay? So suppose there was something here, but this was really, you know, something there. And this band would get blown up. Okay? So if you take something like Q, if you take uh, the plumbing fixture with, with parameter q. Okay? If q was one, we would just add the lengths of these two these two steps. But if q was smaller than one, what you would be doing is joining this at smaller size, and you'd have to blow this up in order to meet your conditions of your minimal area metric, and therefore be integrating over internal cycles of all lengths. Okay, so that's essentially the point. The point is that the that this construction, in its vertices, includes integrals over Riemann surfaces whose, uh, whose band heights are smaller than 2 pi. But all integrals over band heights larger than or equal to 2 pi is, comes in the integral over the moduli space of the plumbing fixer. Is this clear? Shall we, shall we say it more? Shall I try to say it better? Yeah. I'm not okay, let's. Uh, can you say, can, can you try to isolate what you don't? 
So what we have, because these discs here and these discs, this disc here, okay. And according to the fixture construction, okay. Suppose I take some some very small cube, okay. So I take a little region of this thing, okay, and a little region of this thing, and I join them together by plumbing fixture, okay. Suppose you know this is a non-contractible cycle. There's some of the tube here. So that we're talking about the length of the contract. If we want this row, there's no issue. Okay? But suppose we don't. Okay? So when what would I get? Okay. So what would I get? I would get uh, uh, okay, first let me say the pictures, and then if you want, we can try to do it in formulas. Okay. What would I get when I join these two things here? I would have this little tube joined to this little tube. This is this thing joined to this little thing. Okay? Suppose I use some arbitrary metric. Suppose I use some arbitrary metric to describe this structure. But arbitrary metric, I mean arbitrary y factor. Okay? Always instead of the formula we ask Okay? Something that smoothly interpolates between the metric of this surface and the metric of this surface. Okay? Then both of these remain very small. So what I get is a surface that looks like this. Is this clear? Now this surface does not obey the conditions of our minimal area metric. Okay? Because there is a non-contractive cycle, like this one, where there is a geodesic, I mean there's some cycle going around it, whose length is smaller than the five, because it makes you very small. Is this clear? Yeah. So I have to change the y factor in order to put it into this minimal area. Okay? But the y factor acts homogeneously. If you blow up one length, it blows up all lengths. Okay. So, what? You see, I, this, this construction in this metric makes this of length too far. But now we have to move to the y factor such that this length was at most too far. In this construction, it, it will be, I can't remember what, but it will be like something like 2 pi times q. Or maybe q times q bar or something like that. Okay? So, we, we, it's, it's very small. So we have to blow it up. So in doing the blow up, what we'll get is, we, is that this length can be made 2 pi, but that this, this, this length will become 2 pi to right side. Or maybe q times q bar, we have to do the normal okay. You see what I'm saying? Okay? So therefore, if you just integrate over all q less than or equal to 1, okay, you will automatically generate those parts of, of the Riemann surfaces where band heights are greater than 2 pi. You won't get right band heights less than 2 pi. That's why those guys are integrated over in your definition of the Feynman vertices. That's roughly what's going on. Okay, good. So now, uh, uh, this is something I know I may approve this statement to you. I'm just telling you, telling you about the result that. It's claimed that mathematicians know all the answers to it. Okay? I've never seen the proof myself, and I hope I never have to. Okay. Uh, okay. Yes. Okay. So, uh, uh, so okay, but the statement is it. Now, why is this important? Okay. This is important for the following reason. You see, uh, It's important for the following reason. See, where are the points in moduli space? Where are the points in moduli space? Okay? Where you expect, where are the points in moduli space where you expect divergences from? Okay. You, the key point is that you expect divergences from extreme corners of moduli space. Why is that? For instance, suppose we look at uh, the Feynman diagram. Uh, you, you have a Feynman diagram interpretation of what's going on. Yeah. 
when you find the diagram flow find the diagram flow of a tail they have to make around loops or from a position space point of view where the, where the insertions of the operators come very near each other okay or uh, yeah so uh, basically if you go to very very short if something is propagating over very very short distances okay? now very very short distances is compared to the size of the string so it's an extreme corner in moduli space you see the length of the propagator is going to zero compared to that the height or oh, two points are coming close, very close to each other that's another extreme corner in moduli space because the operator in the, the module I included the positions of the operators, the operators merging with each other is an extreme corner. Okay? Uh, so this is this is the final diagrammatic interpretation, you know, uh, final diagrammatic uh, way of saying it. And if you if you think just more structurally in terms of Riemann surfaces, basically interior points in moduli space, there's no scope for any divergence. Everything is nice and smooth and regular. Okay? The only place where you could get a divergence from is where something funny is happening, something going really infinitely. Okay? And that happens at extreme corners of modular space. We've seen this in the torus, for instance. Right? We saw this in the torus when we were integrating over this region in modular space. The only place where divergence could have happened was this thing going on to infinity. Or from here, of course, this guy. And so this is an extreme corner. So the, apparently you will be able It's the same kind of uh, uh, same kind of uh, 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 you know phenomenon that you expect always. Now because of that, this VNG, the vertices that you've added to your graphs, and because they're integrated, you know that includes some integration in moduli space. But that integration is over some very internal region of moduli. We are ensuring that by, uh, by demanding that no cycle get too small. Do you see? You see, we, say, you see, we, we, we are ensuring that no band, which is the size of any cycle, yeah. get too small. Uh, uh, sorry, no, 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 no cycle itself get, get too small. So we are not allowing, say, one cycle of the torus to shrink to zero compared to the other one remaining finite, which would be an extreme corner of modular space. Okay? So these vertices that we're adding are safe. All of the divergences, the potential divergences in the theory, all of the potential divergences in the theory are going to appear from the integral over the moduli at the plumbing mixture. Okay? So, divergences and imaginary paths, things that have to do with unitarity, we can isolate by understanding this plumbing fixture construction level for conformity. That's, that's the key idea. Okay. So, now, this is one more thing. I, I'm sorry, this is going to be a very formal lecture. This will be the last very formal lecture. Then we can we get on. Okay. okay. Uh, we'll, get, we'll get on calculations. Okay. So, is it so far? This lecture has been about charge, but now let's let's turn to conformity. Okay. So suppose you've got a Riemann surface with some mark points. Okay. And you want to do the path integral over the Riemann surface that you form from the plumbing fixture construction. You want to do the path integral of the conformal field theory with these vertex operators. Okay. Uh, then you form from the plumbing fixture construction. Then you form from the plumbing fixture construction of uh, 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 of these two uh, of these two uh, of these two different Riemann surfaces. Now. You see what's going on. What, we, what the plumbing fixture construction essentially is, is cutting the Riemann surface on a circle, cutting the other Riemann surface on a circle, and joining these two ones. But the path integral of this conformal field theory 
with the serpent, with the serpent cut, is some state. Right? You know, what, what you would have here, what you would have here is that the, the path integral of this the formal field theory uh, with, with this disk removed is some state on, on the CFT in the ordinary radio condensation. Similarly, the path integral of this this thing here is some state of the CFT in ordinary radio condensation. Okay? And what you want to do is to join these things up. You want to join these things up with the insertion of the identity operator. But just as we did for the analysis of these four point functions, okay, we can resolve this identity operator into a sum over in terms uh, a, sub, uh, a complete sum states. So instead of looking at the uh, now no, 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 this complete set of states, you see how do you make this complete set of states? You make the complete set of states by putting in a complete set of operators into this disk. Okay? So it's statement. Let's first do it for q equals one and then we take the less one. Suppose you have a Riemann surface that is constructed by the plumbing fixture construction of two different Riemann surfaces. The, the path integral of the formal field theory right? on this bigger plumbing fixture sort of Riemann surface is equal to the path integral on each of the constituent guys with every operator in the theory with, with operators inserted at the center of, centers of the of the disks that you've removed, okay, and then the factor of GMM, the inverse of the zoological metric, put in and summed over this thing being AM, this thing being AN, summed over all of it. You see, well, once again, what's the logic? In, you've got this tube here, you insert identity. Identity is the sum of all states. But each state is filling up this thing with a disk with an object. Okay? So let's say again, we've got this tube here. To cut it. On this cut, you insert identity. But identity is equal to sum over M, N with GMN. Okay, we should really be saying this thing, M A with GMN. Okay? So it's the same thing as this this conformal field theory with state M inserted, yeah? And this conformal field theory with state N inserted. But what is the state M? The state M is filling up the thing with a disk with operator M inserted. So it's undoing the, the plumbing fixture construction. So that you you decompose it into its constituent pieces. You're undoing the plumbing fixture construction so that you decompose it into the constituent pieces, but add an operator M where, where the construction is undone, an operator M where the construction is undone, and put this factor of GMN. And put this factor of GMN. Uh, uh, and put the factor of GMN uh, and some overall operator. Okay, now this was true when q is equal to 1. This was true when q is equal to 1 because in our conventions, a state is created by inserting an operator of, of length 1, oh, sorry, an operator at the origin of a disk of size 1. That gives us the state operator map. Okay, suppose we were working with q less than 1. Then what we're getting is not quite the same state. Right, because then, then inserting the operator at the center of the disk produces not quite the same state, but there's an easy way of, of fixing this up. Fixing you see, just work with a new coordinate. So instead of using the coordinates z1 and z2, work with the coordinates z1 divided by square root 2, so let's say z1, z1 prime, and z2 divided by square root 2, z2 prime. In those coordinates, these disks are each of length 1. Okay? So these coordinates, inserting identity is precisely inserting GMN AA. Okay? But the insertion of A operator in these coordinates is related to the insertion of the A operator in the other coordinates by a factor of 
dz1 prime by dz uh, z1 to the power h and z z1 prime tilde by z z1 tilde to the power h. So as we work that through, when we do the public step instruction with 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 the uh, with packing the q, what you get is a factor of q to the power h, q bar to the power h, g g m n times the constituent surface with a n, the constituent surface with a n, and then all the other surfaces, uh, all the other, uh, all the other, all the other insertions. Okay. So let's understand the claim. The claim is that if you take the Riemann surface that is constructed out of two other Riemann surfaces with a plumbing fixture with parameter Q, okay, then the path integral with some number of insertions on this Riemann surface is the same as the path integral on the constituent Riemann surface, the guy that you use to make the plumbing fixture, okay, with all the possible in uh, operators inserted at the origins. Sum to the GMN, sum to all n and all n, but with the factor of q to the power h, q bar to the power h, added. Remember that the integral, uh, remember that the integral over all uh, uh, Riemann surfaces, okay, includes an integral over all q. Okay, extreme limits of Riemann surfaces are obtained when some plumbing fixture q goes to zero. That makes these lengths very, very long. Okay? Uh, uh, we, we, we were working in a, in, in, in a metric in which no length is allowed to become very short because it's minimal, right? So the only way to get the extreme level is for something that becomes very, very long. Okay, great. Now the last, you know, basically, at the end of this lecture, if we have time, well, but the last statement I'm going to make without trying to justify it, we did. Again, uh, appealing to our discussion of the torus, where we did the same thing very carefully and uh, found the same answer. Um, in string theory, in addition to all this, this business, we have to put in a B, a B insertion for every modulus. So the integral of Q is accompanied by a B0, B0 bar insertion. So we get GMN along with the V0, V0 bar, which gives us the same nice property that we discussed for four-point functions, that it links only states that are annihilated by V0, that states are annihilated by V0. And in addition, we also get a factor of Q, Q from the, uh, from the insertion of, uh, 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 from, the, from the insertion, you know, from the form of the B insertion in the uh, scattering matrix. You know, this form that we're assigned. We found the same factor of 1 over u tau square in the discussion of the torus. It's the same time of discussion. I'm not going to try to derive it again. Okay, fine. Now, with all of this accepted, now we can see the point. Why did I go through all of this? You see, the dangerous part of finding a diagram. The dangerous part of Feynman diagrams, as we've seen, has to do is associated with some Q going to zero. Okay, so let's understand what we get from the limit of some Q going to zero of this public fixture construction. Okay, so what, what we have here is is uh, some amplitude times some other amplitude, and now we completely isolated the Q dependence, just like we did. For the, for, in, the four, in the discussion of four point, three level four point functions, using the, this insertion of complete zero states. Okay? And just as in that case, what we get is q to the power L0 minus 1, q bar to the power L0 minus 1. Okay? Then we got this q, q to the power L0 minus 1, q bar to the power L0 minus 1. Just exactly the same way as in our discussion of four point functions, we have to do this integral over d2q. But now this is the same integral we had in this discussion of four point functions. And for exactly the same reasons, you know, practice in radial coordinates, you get rid of one dr, 
Well, each of you has an explicit factor of mod q, and then there's an integral which removes another mod q. So what you get here is 1 over m squared plus k squared plus minus i epsilon up to some factor of 4 alpha prime. And then there's some 2 pi's, so other way around. Is this clear? This is now exactly parallel to the discussion that we had for the four point functions. Is this clear? It's rewriting L naught and L naught bar in terms of uh, in terms of the mass square and momentum square square of the uh, of the vertex operator. And you just go to the same discussion we had last lecture and you get this. Okay? Good. So the, this, this gives you the integral, the integral over q from uh, zero to one. The key point is this: that we have completely isolated the dependences, the behavior of, of all these diagrams in the region of moduli space where they are dangerous, namely where some q is. Okay, and what we find is that this behavior is precisely given by final diagram by the behavior of final diagrams and in particular all possible divergences are uh, what well, okay so now, now there are two things firstly the imaginary parts of these amplitudes the imaginary parts of these amplitudes are in one to one correspondence with the imaginary parts of a final diagram expansion with internal particles propagating in in internal channels okay and so if you think this through, and we've not done it as carefully as we need to, but so because of this point, if you think this through, the usual arguments of Feynman diagrams giving you unitarity in field theory just go over in a straightforward fashion to imply unitarity for string theory amplitudes. Okay? In the imaginary parts are the imaginary parts of Feynman diagrams. Of, of propagators associated with each propagating particle. Okay, and that essentially results in the uh, uh, in the the unitarity of the string. Okay, the, the second point I want to make is that uh, you see the, the dangerous regions in moduli space, the dangerous regions in moduli space, which have to do with propagation of a very large distance. Which have to do with the, um, you know, the skew goes to zero unit, have all been identified with propagations of particles in space time of very long distances. Okay, so while the string theory can have divergences, for instance, the Bosonic string theory does have divergences, these divergences can always be interpreted as long distances. You see, every dangerous region in moduli space has just been associated with poles of particles propagating over long distances. Okay? So why why, why a string theory can have why a string theory can have divergences, these divergences are always interpretable as long as IR divergences associated with long distances. Now, why is that an improvement? You see. This is an improvement because an IR divergence is a physical thing. An IR divergence tells you that you're working with, say, the wrong, wrong background, or you're expanding your theory with the wrong masses in your propagators or something like that. Okay? It may represent an instability in the theory, in which case you're working with an unstable theory. Okay. But if your theory has no physical instabilities, see, IR divergence is always associated with either asking the wrong question like trying to calculate some scattering amplitudes for gluons and QCD, or with uh, with doing an expansion around the wrong background. You know, if you, if, 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 if you do an expansion around a maximum rather than minim, minimum in a, in a quantum field theory, you will your expansion will be full of IR emergences. Okay, so all the divergences that can occur in string theory. Associated with physical things. Now it could be that you're looking at a string theory which 
in which you've not got the right background, like your background has a maximum rather than a minimum, you'll get higher divergences than you should. Because if you're you won't be doing expansion on a single minimum. However, if you cure all the other problems in the theory, if you work on the good background, like the background for superstring theory in superstring states, so that your theory has no ion divergences, then your whole string amplitude will be fine. Okay, so that is the second, the second main point I want to make. Okay, uh, now let's see. Yeah, so this has been a strange lecture which has had very few equations. I don't really know what to do about that. So to add more equations, we have to do much more work. Um, okay, perhaps we should just leave it at this. So is there anything else I want to say? Uh, Yeah. Okay. Um, there's some very general discussion that I recommend you read in section uh, 9.5 in Kulczynski, in which he talks about um, in which he talks about uh, what's called the fischler suskin mechanism. Okay, in which he talks about how uh, In, in which he addresses the following question. You see, um, in which he addresses the question about uh, addresses the following question. Um, you see, the equations of conformal area uh, invariance. Oh, yeah, wait, 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 uh, let me just say uh, the equation of conformal invariance, as we will see when when we come back, when we we reconvene to discuss our class again. The equations of conformal invariance uh, on the sphere give us the three-level space-time equations of motion. But now there seems like a puzzle because these equations of motion get corrected at loop. But how can equations for consistency of string theory get corrected at loop? You know, this, the equations are just some local property of, of conformal field theories. Okay, uh, conformal invariance is just mean it's not some global statement. You know, beta function matches the local statement. Now, how can that get corrected depending on what manifold we're working? And the answer is that the integral over moduli space uh, has to be has to be regulated, and that that integral over moduli space has its own uh, uh, that that regulation has it the the while factor slips in in that regulation more or less in the way that the while factor slipped in in the regulation of uh, uh, OPs when we try to define. Uh, uh, when we try to define it to the pi kx, for instance, you know, the dimension of the pi kx. Okay, uh, this discussion will make more sense once once we have uh, gone through the discussion of the beta function just in uh, on three level. Okay, so I'm not planning to go to, to to discuss it now, but I suggest you. I mean, it would be a good thing for you. Okay, so I think that we probably want to just stop this lecture here, apart from questions and comments. I'm sorry, I know that this. Was Feel like a very unsatisfactory lecture. Um, what I hope, what I hope I convey in this lecture is a general sense of the issues of unitarity and uh, uh, finiteness of, of, of tree loop uh, of loop amplitudes and string theory. Though there's very fuzzy. Let me just try to summarize this general sense. Let me just try to summarize the general sense, and then uh, uh, let's take questions. Um, the the main the key point is the following. You see, in doing the integral over moduli uh, integral over the moduli space of string theory, you have extreme corners in moduli space. Okay, let's let's first see for the choice. Suppose you do you do the integral over the over the moduli space of the torus, you have uh, uh, you have this region where one of the cycles of the torus becomes very small and the other one becomes very large. Okay? Now, suppose you think of the one, it's only the ratio that matters. 
factor. So it's one of the cycles becoming much smaller than the other. Now, suppose you think of the cycle that's becoming very small as the time dimension. Okay? Whereas the cycle that is remaining large as the space dimension. From a quantum field theory point of view, how would you interpret this? You would interpret it as each of the particles of string theory going over a very small loop in space. The, the, going over a very small region of showing, showing the parameter space. This is the region that would give you divergences in quantum field theory. Is this clear? Is this statement clear? You remember how in our discussion of torus amplitudes, we looked at the closed relationship between Schrodinger parameters of field theory and uh, the moduli space of string theory? Do you remember how we reconstructed the torus amplitude by summing over the Schwinger parameter representation of the one-loop path integral for each particle? And in that reconstruction, the Schwinger parameter was simply just part of the moduli space of the torus. You remember that, right? So one of the one side is the length of the string, the other side is how much time it runs, how, how, how long it goes in Schwinger parameter space. Okay? So the region in which you go a very small circle in Schwinger parameter space is associated with UV divergences in field. Okay? So this is the dangerous region that we should be standing. However, we can take another point of view. We can regard this that cycle as space and the other one as, as time. As we go back. Then perform a wild transformation, so that guy stays in length 2 pi. But on doing this wild transformation, what happens to the other guy? It comes very long. Okay? So the region of, of potential damage. In field theory space, the region over which you go over based on a certain shrink of parameter space cannot be problematic unless there is also a problem in some other region. Namely, where the shrink of parameter is, uh, length becomes very large. The shrink of parameter length becoming very large is associated with distance, propagation over very long distance. Okay? Remember what a shrink of parameter is. It's e to the power minus tau times k squared plus m squared. So if tau becomes very large, or very, 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 very large, you're getting contributions to a small k. It's, it's got an inverse relationship with k. Okay? And therefore long distances. Tau is like length squared. Okay? So, on the torus, we've already seen this, but I want to emphasize it because it's Today's lecture is how it's more general, is about how it's more general. The, the point is the following that it's impossible, first point on UV parameters, it's impossible in string theory to have a problem in the UV unless you also have a problem in the UV. More precisely, you, there's always a way of looking at string, uh, uh, looking at the moduli space of Riemann surface in the string theory such that all extreme limits are always interpreted as IR extremes. Okay? Then if your theory is IR 